Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian McLogan and in this video we are going to work on the law of cosines. Now this is the third lesson in our chapter for applications of trigonometry. This is a lesson that I went over with my students that I am going to now go teach to you to develop the key and also to hopefully help you understand when and how to apply the law of cosines. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about finding the missing measures of an oblique triangle, the missing angles as well as sides, when given side, 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 as well as side, angle, side, as well as how to find the area of a triangle. Now the way I started this lesson was I kind of went back to inverse trigonometry and I gave these students these four problems. I said, all right, let's go ahead and you know evaluate the inverse. And I was hoping that they went to use the unit circle, but now since this chapter they have a calculator, a lot of students went ahead and just you know plugged them into the calculator. But I'm going to use the unit circle, so therefore I'm going to use the exact measurements here. Uh, and you can always verify uh, my measurements by using a calculator, which you will be want to kind of follow along with me in this lesson with a graphing or a scientific calculator. All right, so again, remember the sine inverse is basically saying the, you know, the sine of what angle equals one half. And if we remember in radian more, actually we're going to use everything in degrees. Um, so we're kind of go through in degrees here. So this was equal to, in degrees, that's going to be 30 degrees. And then when sine inverse were negative one half, we're gonna think of negative 30 degrees. Now again, remember, some people might think of, you know, how do we, because we kind of went back already through a chapter on solving. Remember that the sine inverse function, right, is restricted on the first and the fourth quadrants, right? Because if you don't restrict it, you know, sine is equal to one half here and here. Right? But again, you can't have two answers when you're evaluating for the sine inverse of one half. There's only one answer, right? Because it's a function. So therefore, that's why we have it restricted between negative pi halves and pi halves or negative 90 and 90 degrees. That's why the only answer is 30 degrees. You're not going to get this answer over here. Same thing for negative 30 degrees. You can see that it's going to be down there. That meets the restriction. This angle is outside of the restriction, which would end up being um, 210 degrees. Now we go ahead and go look at cosine. Now cosine has a different restriction, right? So the cosine inverse of one half, that's basically saying the cosine of what angle equals one half, but cosine is restricted between the first and the second quadrant. And when we look at that, we could say cosine is equal to one half, that's going to be this angle right here, which is going to equal 60 degrees. And then when we do cosine of negative one half, it's going to be over here. And again, these two angles, they also are angles where cosine is equal to one half and at cosine is equal to negative one half, but they don't meet the restriction. And again, that was such an important um, lesson that we talked about for inverse trigonometry that there's only one answer, right? And your calculator is only going to give you one answer. And that angle obviously is going to be 120. Now, the point that I wanted to bring with the students is they were, you know, typically were able to evaluate this rather quickly by the unit circle or their calculator. But the point I wanted to drive home is, you know, looking at these similarities, like a lot of students notice that the sign, you know, whatever this angle is, if you have the negative um, version, you're going to have the negative angle. And then for here, when you have the negative um, value, you're just going to double it, right? So they recognize that doubling relationship and the positive and the negative. But I really wanted for students to understand and to dive deep why that's happening. Again, any angle that's positive up here, right, for sine inverse, when you take the negative value, yeah, it's just going to be reflected about the x-axis, right, because it's either in the first or the fourth quadrant. Um, and the cosine, you can see that here's the positive values for cosine, there's the negative value. So yeah, you're just going to be doubling those angles, you know, in the first and the second quadrant. But what I really want students to come away from this is when you're doing sine inverse, you're only going to get an acute angle. Right? When you have a restriction between negative 90 and positive 90, you're never going to get an obtuse angle. You're only going to get an acute angle. And that was the problem with the ambiguous case. If you remember, when we were trying to find a missing angle, we were using sine inverse, which was only going to give us the negative angle. We were never going to get the positive angle. That's why we always that's why we had that test with the height to find if there was an obtuse, uh, if there was a two triangle case, right? Because if we just relied on sine inverse, that's not that's not Sorry, if we relied on sine inverse, and that's not going to be enough information to determine um, if we're given the acute angle or if we're supposed to be given the obtuse angle. So the nice thing about today's lesson, or at least partially about today's lesson, is when we do cosine inverse, it's going to give us the acute or the obtuse angle, 
right? So whatever it is, it's gonna give us that value. If it's 60 degrees or 120 degrees. And again, as long as the angle is between zero and 180, it's gonna be an angle inside of the triangle, right? So we don't have to worry about that ambiguous phase case for cosine inverse um, when, or when using cosine inverse because it, the restriction is between zero and 180. So it will give us whatever the angle is. However, for sine, that, that doesn't give us the obtuse angle. It only gives us the acute version. So therefore, we have to do a little bit further test, and that's what was kind of difficult. So our goal today, and I spent a lot of time with students, is our goal today is to avoid that ambiguous case. And I'll give you what you're going to need. I'll explain to you how to avoid it. But I just wanted you guys to see the difference here between the cosine inverse and the sine inverse, and that really allows us to, I think, better understand our approach as we're going to work through uh, these examples. So here's the law of cosines. Um, I just kind of gave these to the students. I didn't really work into the proof like I did for the law of sines. Um, it's the same equation for the top and the bottom um, for the students. You know, the one thing to just kind of notice is typically when you want to solve for the um, for an for the side length, then you're going to use the top equation. And if you want to solve for the missing angle, you're going to use this bottom equation. But notice the bottom equation is really just the exact same equation um, as the top equation, just solve for cosine of A. It's also important to notice that these are solved for, or at least A is kind of semi-isolated, right? At least this one's A squared and this one's cosine of A. But obviously we're not always gonna be solving for A. Sometimes it's gonna be B or C. So whatever your angle is, or whatever your angle or your side length is, just swap it with what you have. So for instance, you know, I get this a lot with my students, um, you know, we'll need to solve for B squared. So I said, all right, wherever, um, just swap A and B. So now it's gonna be a squared plus c squared minus two times a times c times cosine of b, right? So it doesn't matter what angle you're solving for. Oh, you wanna solve for c? Okay, then just swap the c and a. So c squared equals b squared plus a squared minus two times b times a times cosine of big c, right? So you can kind of see that relationship. I'm just swapping the variables. The other thing to always verify this, I always like to do, is you know for this first equation the first the first side length and the last and the angle are always the same right that's little b big b little c big c little a big a so that's one way I kind of to check and then these are the other two angles and those are the other two or the other two sides and those are the other two sides so once you kind of do it a couple of times you'll kind of get a little bit easier a little bit easier for you and again just to remember we're going to label these these are for acute I'm sorry um, oblique triangles. So we're just going to label opposite sides and their angles. All right, so let's go on and get um, on with it with the side, side, side. All right, for the first example, it says find the missing measures of the triangle side, side, side using the law of cosines. Now, I don't really need to tell you to use the law of cosines because once you draw this triangle, you realize there's no way for you to create a ratio because we're not given any angles. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw an oblique triangle. I don't really know at this point if it's obtuse or acute. So I am just going to default that it's going to be acute. And I can always change it at the end um, if I see that it's going to be different. Okay, so there's going to be my um, triangle. And you can see I just have the side lengths. Now, the important thing is we need to say, all right, well, we can just find an angle. Like we have a formula, right, to find the missing angle. So should we just use A because that's what our formula is? Or should we be a little strategic? And that was the point of me spending that time at the beginning is making sure you guys understood like we need to avoid the law of signs or at least not avoid the law of signs. We need to avoid the ambiguous case. We want to make sure that when we're taking the sine inverse that there's no option for us to have an acute and obtuse angle and not know which one is which. All right. So now the good news about this whole section is if you feel comfortable, once you feel comfortable with the law of cosines, you can just continue using the law of cosines to find all the missing measures. So you don't actually have to transfer over to the law of signs. However, some students like to obviously solve things with the law of signs. It's a little bit quicker and a little bit um, less tedious of typing things into a calculator. So they sometimes aren't gonna make as many mistakes as they would with the law of cosines. But the main thing is we have to avoid or have to make sure we're aware of is that ambiguous case. And so we wanna make sure that we rule out the possibility of there being an obtuse angle or another angle larger than the one we're going to find. So what, that, so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna find the largest angle of our triangle first. So when you have side, 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 always find the largest angle of your triangle 
first. And if you remember from geometry class, the largest angle is gonna have the largest opposing side. So you can see here we have side length six, or for C, it's gonna be six, that's the largest side. That means angle C is going to be the largest. So what's nice about that is when I find angle C, now again, the law of cosines is gonna tell you exactly what C is. Um, I don't need to worry about my other two angles being larger than C, right? Because remember, if you were to use sine inverse, it's only gonna give you an acute angle. It doesn't give you a possible option for it to be obtuse. Well, if C is the largest angle, there's no way that my A and B can be obtuse because that's the largest angle in the triangle. And if that's one, if that's, if there's gonna be an obtuse angle, it's going to be C. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to use this formula, but for C. And I'm just gonna make sure that um, wherever I see a, an A, I'm gonna swap it with the C for the whole formula, all right? So therefore I'll have, in this case, cosine of big C equals B squared minus A squared plus A squared minus C squared all over two times B times A. All right, and I just wanna make sure that I did everything correctly. It's the opposing two side lengths minus A, same as that angle, divided by two times the other two side lengths. Perfect. Um, and then it's plus minus, right? Okay, yeah, it's been a, been a low. Now, we're just gonna go ahead and plug things in, okay? And you are gonna wanna make sure you can follow along with the calculator. There is some um, big tips here that are gonna come with how to type this into a calculator. For right now, I'm just gonna show you how, um, I'm just gonna take this lengths and then plug them into the formula. So we'll have five squared plus four squared minus six squared. That's gonna be all over two times five times four. Okay, now it's very important that when you're typing this in the calculator, a lot of students want to just type everything in and just let the calculator do their magic, right? But it's, you have to be very careful. If, if you wanna type in four divided by you know five times three, um, if you type it in as four, divided by five times three, then what your calculator is gonna do is your calculator is gonna do four divided by five and times three. That's not what we want to happen, right? So what we want to do is we wanna do four divided by parentheses five times three. So it's very important when you're typing these problems into your calculator, especially if you're gonna type everything in together, make sure you're using parentheses. So what my advice is for students is to do two things. You can either put the numerator and the denominator in an extra set of parentheses, which sometimes gets confusing. If you have a, you know, a graphing calculator, it's a little bit easier than with like a scientific. Or you can just find the numerator, evaluate the numerator, evaluate the denominator, and then divide them out separately, okay? Now, obviously we could probably do a lot of this um, in our head, these are not crazy numbers. But I'm just gonna go ahead and type everything in so this will be 25, or sorry, five squared plus four squared minus six squared, just because I wanna make sure everybody gets the same values as I am. So five divided by 40, and then five divided by 40 is going to be 0.125. Now again, that is not the angle, right? So cosine of C is equal to 0.125, right? That's not what C is. The angle is not 0.125. The cosine inverse of 0.125 is going to be our angle. So now we can see the cosine inverse of 0.125. I can just type this in there now. And that's going to be 82.89. So I'm going to round this to 82.819 degrees. I'm going to round this to your nearest thousandth. I might have a rounding error at the end. Everything might not add perfectly up to 180. But that's because I'm going to be rounding, um, rounding them. But hopefully you guys can um, see in case, actually I'm just gonna leave everything truncated. But either way, so therefore we have our angle C, right? So cool, now all we need to do is find another one of our angles. Now again, since we found the largest angle, I'm not worried about using the law of sines or the ambiguous case coming up. So all I'm simply going to do is I'm just gonna pick either you know A or B and just go ahead and solve. Now one thing I do not want to do is use this rounded version of this angle that I gave. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my angle that I just found and I'm gonna use the storing feature on my calculator. So I'm gonna hit STO store and I'm gonna save this as alpha C. Okay, so and then I'm gonna label this on my work so therefore I know that it's a stored answer. Now I'm gonna use the law of signs to figure out what B is. So I will see, and again, we need to find the angle. So I'm gonna use the sine of B 
over 5 equals the sine of stored C over 6. Okay, and then I can say the sine of B is going to be 5 times the sine of stored C divided by 6. All right, and that's going to give me some decimal, 0.826, right? But again, I'm not going to use the rounded answer. I'm just going to go from here. I'm just going to do the sine inverse of that last answer. And B is going to equal 55.771. And then to go ahead and um, you can store that as alpha B, then to find A, all I'm going to simply do is do 180 degrees minus B minus C. Okay, so I'm going to store that answer there. And then I'll just do 180 minus alpha B minus alpha C. And then in this case, A is going to equal 41.410 if you wanted to round it. And again, guys, I know I might have a rounding error from there, but that's okay. That's at least going to be my margin from my rounding errors. But at least you can see here now I've found A, my A, B, and my C. All right? So next example, you can see that we have a um, side, side, side. So we're just going to do the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to draw the angles here. And I recognize, again, C is going to be my largest angle here. So let's go ahead and... Um, so that'd be 60, B is going to be 51.7, and A is going to be a 22.5. Okay, so again, let's just go ahead and evaluate. I got a lot of extra room here. So I'll do cosine of big C equals A squared plus B squared minus C squared all over 2 times A times B. I don't know why. Why did I do the whole formula again? Whatever. Um, so now this one, I'm, def I'm just going to type in all together. So I'm going to use my parentheses on this one. So um, I'm just going to type this all at once. So I want you guys to kind of see how I'm typing this in. And I'm definitely going to be using parentheses, okay? A lot of parentheses. So I'm going to put, I'm going to use brackets just to kind of differentiate my grouping symbols. And that's going to be over another bracket here, 2 times A times B, which is 51.7. Okay, so open parentheses, um, then we'll do another parenthesis. Oops, parenthesis, 22.5 squared plus 51.7 squared minus 60, um, 60 quantity squared, close that parenthesis, divided by two, oops, I'm sorry, divided by open parenthesis, two times 22.5, I don't really need those in parentheses, times 51.7, close parentheses. There you go. And then now I'm just going to do the sine inverse here of that answer. Not of that answer, I need cosine inverse. What am I doing, I'm crazy. Okay, so cosine inverse of that answer and I get 100.422. So therefore I can say C, uh, so cosine of big C equals, I got negative 0.18089, so therefore C is gonna equal 100.422. And again, I'm gonna store that as alpha C, so therefore I can use it later. Um, <clears throat> now, though, I can use, so I'll store this as C. Okay, now though, I can go ahead and use my law of sines, law of cosines again. So again, it doesn't really matter. I already have an obtuse angle, so I'm not worried about there being another obtuse angle. I can just go about the law of sines. And that's the nice thing is, like as long as you are aware that there's no way for you to get another obtuse angle, or there's, you know, there's not gonna be an obtuse angle, then you can just go through the law of sines. So that either happens when you have an obtuse angle already, or when you know that you found already the largest angle in the triangle. Um, so what am I looking for here? Um, all right, so let's just go ahead and let's solve for B. 
So I have sine of B over 51.7 is equal to the sine of stored C over 60. So then I'll do the sine of B, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take 51.7, I'm gonna multiply that on both sides, so I'm gonna multiply that by the sine of my stored answer C, and I'm gonna divide that by 60. So that equals you know, 0.847, and then I'm gonna take the sine inverse of that, so I'll do sine inverse of that last answer, I'm not gonna use the rounded answer I wrote in there, but when I do that, I get a 57.935, degrees, and then A, I'll just store that as alpha A, and then A is going to be again 180 minus my stored answer B minus my stored answer C. So I'll do 180 minus alpha B minus alpha C. Oh, that's not right. 180 minus alpha B minus alpha C. Did I store? Oh. Oh, I stored that as A. Wait a minute. All right. Let's check here. Let's see. Alpha C. Got that one stored. Alpha A. Oh, I did that as alpha A. Oops. Got to be careful with your angles. So I get 21.64. And the other thing to kind of like make sense of this as well, like your angle should make sense, right? And again, we can always check our angles. Now, again, I know I'm rounding, so my angles are not going to perfectly add up to 100, um, 180. But again, like that 21 and the 100.4, like that should work, right? That's almost 20, that's almost 58, that's almost 52. So you can see like, yes, those are going to add up to 180 or very, very close to it, right? We're going to have a little rounding error, um, but that's perfectly fine. So um, you can notice, like I noticed that my angle, I can't remember what I had, like 224. I'm like, well, that's wrong. So you got to be careful. I actually stored mine as the wrong angle that I said. So, or maybe I said it wrong. I don't know. Um, but you just want to make sure you're careful with that. All right. So now let's kind of move on to the area. So the area of a triangle, like when we previously talked about the area of a triangle, um, and this was Heron's formula. Got to give credit where credit is due. Um, so previously when we looked at the area of a triangle, we were looking at one half base times height. Well, again, we need to know the height in terms of the, if you remember, we had to figure out the base, um, which was a side length. But for in terms of the height, we figured out the height using a, with respect to one of the angles. Well, if we don't have any angles here, obviously we could use the law of cosines to go ahead and find an angle and then use that formula but it's gonna be a little bit quicker just to go ahead and use this formula. So the formula for area here is basically just going to be um, the S equals the sum of the sides divided by two. And then you can basically just see it's gonna be S times S minus A times S minus B times S minus C. And the nice thing about this formula is you can just plug everything in at once. So the really the main thing you wanna do first is find S. So that's gonna be four plus five plus six divided by two. And that's going to be 15 halves. Since we have a calculator, that's going to be 7.5. So now the area equals the square root 7.5 times 7.5 minus 4. It doesn't matter the order that you go about. And again, one of the important things that to recognize from this is obviously if the side length is larger than S, then you can't have a triangle. Right, because what that would do is that produce a negative answer, and you can't take the square root of a negative. The other way that you can also recognize when you wouldn't have a triangle is if s minus one of your side lengths is zero. Well, because then you obviously would be taking the square root of zero, and that means the area would be zero. So those are another ways. Sometimes you'll be asked like if the side lengths make the triangle. I think you should use the inequality, the side lengths. Right, any two, the sum of any two sides should always be greater than the third side. But again, you could also use Heron's formula to justify um, if, uh, if a triangle exists given the angle measurements. All right, so now the nice thing about this is again, I can just plug this exactly how it's written. I don't have to worry about um, the or my calculator doing a different order of operations. Or not an order, yeah, 
or at least following the order of operations, not as I'm attending them. So I'm just gonna plug it exactly as how it's written, and I get an area equal to 9.922 rounded. And I don't have any units, but just remember if you did have units like feet or inches, you'd want to use that unit squared. Okay, um, now let's go and get into the next one. Again, you can kind of see the same thing. Um, I don't really need to draw a picture of this triangle. I just recognize this. I just need to figure out my S. So my S is going to be 22.5 plus 51.7 plus 60, all divided by 2. So 22.5 plus 51.7 plus 60 divided by 2 is 67.1 all right so again area so that's 67.1 times 67.1 minus 22.5 times 67.1 minus 51.7 times 67.1 minus 60 so again if you just want to check your work Let's just plug this in really quickly um, to make sure that we have the right answer. And again, really the main thing that students, um, they'll make their mistakes on is typing something in, dropping a parenthesis, um, you know, forgetting a decimal point. So you just wanna make sure even though you can do this rather quickly, you just wanna make sure you're careful with how you're typing everything in. And then I'm just going back through it, make sure I typed everything in and right. And you can see, actually, I didn't because I didn't put it under a square root. So I am crazy. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm just going to evaluate that, and I'll just take the square root of that answer. There you go. And I'm getting area equals 572.029. And again, you guys can see, in this case, like, that makes sense, right? Um, and the same thing for the other, other value. You can see that that area, like, works, okay? Okay. Um, like it's not like 9,000 or like 0.9, you know? So obviously when you have something like that, make sure your area would make sense relative though to those side lengths. All right, so the next set of problems we have is when we're gonna have side, angle, side. Now, sometimes students will confuse these with looking at them to be angle, side, side because they see the angle and they see the two sides. So that's why I always tell students to draw the triangle first. Now, if I if this was angle side side, I would always do the angle and then I do side side. Well, in this case, we see this is 42 degrees. Well, I don't have any more angles, so let's call this um, let's call this B. Let's call this A. Well, B is seven and A is five. So you can see this isn't angle side like angle side side. This is side angle side, right? So draw the triangle, because a lot of times you're not gonna know that it's side angle side, nor are you gonna know to use the law of cosines. But obviously once I draw the triangle, I realize I can't use the law of sines, I don't have a ratio, so I have to use the law of cosines. Um, now, the problem with the using the law, or not really the problem with the law of cosines, but if you wanna find a missing angle, if you remember from our formula, when I wanted to find a missing, um, let's go all the way back up, if I want to find an angle, I need to have all three side lengths, right? So I don't have all three side lengths. However, if you're looking for a missing side, like if you're missing for this, if you're looking for A, you need to have cosine of A. Or you, I'm sorry, you need to have angle A. So if you have angle A, then you can find A. And then all you need to know is B and C. So that's exactly what we have. We have a angle and we have the other two side lengths. So that means we can go ahead and find um, our opposing side length of our angle. So that's going to be A. All right, so what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm just gonna write, go back to the formula. So that's gonna be a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus two times b times c times the cosine of a, all right? And now it really just kind of comes into plugging things in. Um, so a squared is equal to seven squared plus seven, wait a minute, five, b and c. What am I doing? Uh, did I write that down? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to solve for C. I'm like losing my mind. So I'm not solving for A. I was like looking at that as A, but that's going to be C. So I'm trying to solve for C squared. So C squared equals, apologize, A squared plus B squared minus um, A times B times the cosine of C. 
okay? So basically all I'm doing is I'm swapping the A and the C variable from our original formula. And again, just to look at this, that's gonna be the opposing two side lengths, added squared add, minus two times A times C. Okay, and again, let me just go back and double check just to make sure I'm not doing anything crazy. <coughs> Angle, the opposing two side lengths, minus two times B times C times cosine of A, okay. So um, now it's just gonna plug everything in. So I have C squared equals, so this would be five squared plus seven squared minus two times five times seven times the cosine of 42 degrees. Now the nice thing about doing this is I can actually just type everything in as it's written. So I don't have to worry about like that division again. So this would be five squared plus seven squared minus two times five times seven times cosine of 42 degrees. And then I'm gonna get C squared is equal to 21.979. And remember though, that's C squared, so you need to take the square root of that answer. So therefore C is equal to 4.688. Now, again, does that kind of make sense, right? 21 was kind of big. For an, especially an angle at 42 degrees. Um, so that one's kind of big. So, but four kind of makes sense, okay? Roughly that kind of looks all right for that triangle. Now, the next thing is, now what do we do? Should we go ahead and find now the B? Because we find B, um, or if now, we can go and use the law of sines because we have an angle. And that's where a lot of students will make the mistake. Or if they say, well, let's go and use the law of sines to find B because that's gonna give us the largest angle. That's right, but remember, the law of sines only gives you the acute version of that larger side. So we do not want to um, use the law of sines because we're not sure if there's an acute angle or not. So what you're gonna wanna do is use the law of cosines here. So only time we really want to um, go to the using the law of sines is when we have that side, 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 and we've eliminated the largest angle of the triangle. And what I'll do is I'll show you why that can be a mistake. So let's go ahead and use the law of cosines to find cosine of B. So that's going to be A squared plus um, C squared minus B squared all over two times A times C. So cosine of B equals, so let's see here, it's gonna be five squared plus, I don't have C squared, what am I doing? Um, oh, I do have C. I need to store this. So I'm going to store that answer. I forgot to do that because I don't want to use the rounded answer, so I'm going to store that as alpha C. Okay, so, and then it's gonna be minus B squared, so that's gonna be minus the seven squared. Two times five times C. I'm sorry, times C, stored C. All right, so, now on this one, I'm gonna make sure I need to use my parentheses, right? So, use some brackets here. All right, so I'll do five squared um, plus stored answer C squared minus seven squared divided by two, I'm sorry, parentheses, two times five times alpha C. Okay, and in this case, I get a negative um, 0 0.04. So therefore, cosine of B equals a negative 0 0.043. And then again, you need to use cosine inverse. So B is gonna equal the cosine inverse of that answer. And I'm gonna get a 92.47 um, rounded degrees. Okay, so you can see that B is actually an obtuse angle. Now again, that would not happen if I did the law of sines. So let's just do it just for the sake of learning. Um, what, how would you, like what if you did do the law of sines instead? So if you did, you know, cosine of B over seven is equal to the cosine of 42 degrees over stored answer C. B is gonna equal, and watch this. So you do seven times the cosine of 42 divided by stored answer C. That's not right, hold on. Seven times cosine of 42 divided by stored answer C. 
Oh yeah, cosine. Oh, it's cosine. What am I doing? You're using the law of sines. <laughs> I went to sine. I'm like, what is going on here? That's the sine of B over the sine of 42. Jeez, law of sines. So seven times the sine of 42 divided by alpha C. And then if you did sine inverse of that, answer, I get 87.5. Okay. Now again, like these are related to each other, right? But this is the acute version. B again, sine inverse is only going to give you the acute version. So how do you go from this B to that B? Well, technically, if you do 180 minus B, you're going to get 92.47. The problem with this is you don't know if you're supposed to do that or not, right? You don't have enough information to confirm is it the acute or is it the obtuse. However, if you use the law of cosines, the law of cosines will tell you that is the angle. You don't have to guess and worry, hmm, I wonder if it's acute or if it's the obtuse version, right? So that's why we want to stick with the law of cosines. Um, so now I have B and I have A, or I have C and I have B, so let's go and find A. So A is going to, I already found C, so remember I stored that. So now A is going to be, let's store this as angle B. Where was that angle? So I'll store that as alpha B, and then I'll do 180 minus 42 degrees minus um, alpha B. And by doing that, I have 180 minus 42 minus alpha B. So therefore, that's going to equal 45.53 degrees. And again, I'm just rounding this. So again, I could have a rounded answer there. But again, this is just very important not to go to this law of sines once you've done the law of cosines, okay? So now let's just do one more example here. In this case, I have 43 degrees and 57 minutes. So what I'm going to want to do in this case is take my 43 degrees and then I'm going to add that to 57 over 60, right? Because if I have 57 minutes out of 60, that's going to give me a decimal, which is 0.95. So therefore, that's going to equal 43.95 degrees, all right? So I want to convert it to decimal form. And now let's just go ahead and sketch our graph here. So let's just call this A. So 43.95. Um, that's supposed to be B, actually because this is supposed to be side angle side. So let's call this one B, so that's 7.5. And this would be C, so that's going to be 8.5. All right? So again, you can see we're looking for A squared. So again, just kind of like what we did before, A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2 times B times C times the cosine of A. Now in this case, I'm just going to plug everything in, because we've already kind of covered everything. So I'm just going to say that's going to be the square root of 7.5 squared plus 8.5 squared minus 2 times 7.5 times 8.5 times the cosine of 43.95. Okay, so we can just type this all in together. So do the square root of 7.5 squared plus 8.5 squared minus 2 times 7.5 times 8.5 times the cosine of 43.95. And I'm getting A equals 6.059 rounded. And again, like that, that works, like that makes sense for that. I'm going to store that as alpha A. Now, it's going to be very important that I need to solve for one of my missing angles. Again, I'm going to use, um, going to want to use the law of cosines. Do not do the law of sines. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and go to B. So cosine of B, because we haven't done that one yet. That will be A squared plus C squared minus B squared, all over 2 times A times C. So therefore, the cosine of B is going to equal. So let's go ahead and actually... Um, type that out. So let's see, a squared, so that's going to be 
Where's A? Oh, that's going to be stored A squared plus C minus B squared. So that's going to be 7.5 all over 2 times stored A and then times C, which is 7.5. All right, so now let's go ahead and do that. Again, just make sure you're using your parentheses again. This is that number one mistake that students make there. So we have alpha A squared um, plus 8.5 squared. Now this one, actually, I'm just going to do everything on kind of on its own, 7.5 squared. Okay, and then I'm going to divide that by the quantity, 2 times alpha A times 7.5. And then, so I'm getting cosine of beta is, or B, sorry, is 0.579. So therefore, B is equal to, kind of move over here. So I'm going to do cosine inverse of that last answer. And I get 54.552. That's a rounded answer, all right? So um, we already have A, so therefore, C is going to equal... Um, B, which I'm going to store, so it's going to be 180 degrees minus 43.95 minus stored answer B. So I'll do 180 minus alpha B minus 43.95. And therefore C is equal to 81.498. Degrees. And again, I'm just going to do a kind of quick little spot check to make sure that they get me pretty close. Like I shouldn't have um, obviously something very larger than 180 or very close. Like obviously I can have a rounding error um, based on at least my instructions here. Um, but I should generally be very, very close to 180 degrees, which it looks like I am going to meet. So that's kind of the basics for using the law of sines. I'm sorry, the law of cosines when we have a side 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 and a side angle side. Now what we want to do is kind of get into these word problems and see how we're going to address um, a, a word problem. So the first word problem we're going to work with is going to be with a bearing. So it says a ship leaves port at 1 p.m. and sails in the direction of north 38 degrees west. So I was very um, at it with my students that whenever they see the bearing, again, if you remember from the law of signs, is to draw um, a compass heading. So it's going north 38 degrees west, all right? So I don't know how far it's going, but I'm just going to do that and say, all right, let's make that 38 degrees west. So we're going north 38 degrees west at a rate of 20 miles per hour. Okay, cool. So that's going to be the rate 24 miles per hour, but I don't know for how long yet, so I'll just keep on reading. Then another ship leaves port. So again, obviously this is port at 1.30 p.m. And that sails in the direction of north 52 degrees west. So that's going to be a little bit farther. Again, I don't know how far these are going from each other, but I can see this is going a little bit slower at 19 miles per hour. Um, now it says at 2.30, how far apart are the two ships? So we're looking for basically how far apart they're going to be. So D equals, I'll just say the distance the ships are apart. So that's the distance that ships are apart. Now we gotta find how long are those lengths, right? So we have 38 and we have what, 52? Okay. Um, let's try to draw that a little bit better. So here, I'll do this put it right there. No. There we go, kind of. Looks like that. Okay, so anyways, that's gonna be 52, that's 38, got it. Now, um, if we leave it, if we leave at one, two, at, we, the first one leaves at one, and then we're asking for 2.30, then it's been traveling for 24 miles per hour for an hour and a half. Well, one hour, it traveled 24 miles, so if it travels for a half, that's gonna be 12 miles, so therefore this is going to be 36 miles. And then over here, 
this left at 1.30 and we're clocking it at 2.30. So that's going to just be one, um, one hour. And if it's traveling at 19 miles per hour, that's going to be at 19 miles. Now, typically, you know, sometimes I, typically I tell students to draw the triangle, you know, draw the picture and then you can go and solve. But sometimes it's just like, this is like kind of too much, right? I'm not really sure where, you know, I want to make sure I can see the triangle and see exactly what I have. So a lot of times I just tell students to kind of just redraw the triangle. Like forget about the picture, like keep the picture, right? Let's kind of keep this. But now let's just draw the triangle separately with its measurements. So I have something that looks like this. Now again, we need to figure out like that's the angle. Well, if this is 52 and that's 38, what is this angle? Well, again, that angle right there is gonna be 52 degrees minus 38 degrees, right? And you can see that that's going to be 14. This length is 36, I'll drop the miles just to keep things simple, and that's 19, and then we're looking for D. So now you can see that we have, okay, we have side, angle, side, and we're looking for D. Um, so now I just need to use the law of sines, um, and I'm gonna be looking for D for the answer D. So again, using the formulas, now we don't have A, Bs, and Cs, and that's fine. So what we're just simply gonna do is hopefully you remember the relationship between those two sides. It's gonna look something like this. D squared equals 19 squared plus 36 squared. So it's the two other sides squared minus two times 19 times 36 times the cosine of 14 degrees, okay? So now all I'm simply gonna do is just plug this in. So I'll have 19 squared plus 36 squared minus two times 19 times 36 times the cosine of 14 degrees. I don't remember that's what I got there. Cosine of, hmm. Um, I don't remember that being the, did I square those? Yeah, I did. Where my answer being? Oh, maybe that was it. Okay, yeah, that works. Okay, so I just, it's been a while since I was going through this and I was thinking, yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so that does make sense. So the point is a lot of students will go ahead and get to this and they say, oh, the answer is 329. And I said, all right, we got to make sure when you guys are doing word problems, make sure again, if you remember, like one of the things we talked about at the beginning of the lesson is make sure it makes sense, right? This doesn't make any sense. If, you know, one ship's going 36 miles and another ship's going 19 miles, does it make sense for them after an hour for, to be 329 miles apart from each other? No, because remember it's D squared. So now if you take the square root of both sides, you're gonna get D equals 18.156 miles. That makes a little bit more sense, right? If one travels 36 miles and the other one travels 19 miles in relatively the same direction, you can see that they're gonna be 18 miles apart and that makes sense. So just make sure that one, draw the picture, create the triangle, set up the equation using the law of cosines, um, check your answer, make sure it makes sense, and then make sure you apply the correct units. All right, the next example is again another bearing problem. Um, but in this one, we're gonna have a cruise ship travels at a bearing of 40 degrees. So it's a little bit different bearing. So I'm gonna have a bearing 40 degrees. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw that. Okay, so 40 degrees is gonna be roughly something like this. All right, and it's gonna travel 40 degrees at 20 miles per hour for three hours. Now again, if it's going 20 miles per hour for one hour, that's 20 miles. So therefore I can say that's going to be at 60. Okay, um, then it's gonna change course to a bearing of 120. So I'm gonna bring this down a little bit. Not that one, this one. Okay, so again, it's changing course. So what that means is I need to create another compass heading. So now it's going from north, it's gonna go 120. Well, from here to here is 90, right? So 120 is gonna be like 30 degrees more. And it's gonna, looks like it's gonna go 20 miles per hour for two hours, so it's gonna be 50. So it's gonna be a little bit shorter than that. All right, and then we'll just say from there. Um, now it's saying find the distance the ship is from its original position, um, and also it's bearing from its original position. Okay, 
So here is the distance, direct distance from its original position, we'll call D. So D equals distance from original position. All right, um, we have, so that's gonna be 60. So that's 40 degrees. And then we know this is 120. Okay, so forget about the side lengths for a second. Let's just figure out the angles. So I don't know what this angle is. Um, however, one thing we wanna keep in mind is remembering like when we have compass settings, we create parallel lines, right? North-South is parallel with North-South for both those compass settings. So what's important about that is when you have parallel lines, look for the transversal because look for alternate interior angles, alternate exterior angles, corresponding angles, um, same side interior. So, you know, look for same side exterior are going to be complementary or supplementary. So look for those angle relationships. So therefore, if I know this is 40 degrees, then I know that's going to be 40 degrees. Also, I recognize that this is 120, then these are supplementary angles. That means this has to be 60 degrees, right? So again, actually I'll put it in, um, so I'll put 50. I'll just put it in parentheses so I know it's not an angle. Okay, so now I have an angle and you can see that I have again another two side lengths. So what I'll do here is I'm just gonna kind of redraw this triangle. All right, and let's see, I have this angle is going to be 100 degrees, this is going to be 50, and this is going to be 60. So now you can see I can definitely go ahead and find this distance D. So in this case, I'm just gonna go with the square root. I'm not gonna make that mistake, you know, like a lot of students will make. Um, and I will just go through, this is to be 60 squared plus 50 squared, minus two times 60, times 50, times the cosine of 100 degrees. All right, so now I can just plug this all into my calculator. So I'll do 60 squared plus 50 squared, minus two times 60 times 50 times the cosine of 100. Now I could have put this under the square root, I forgot to. If you do forget to do the square root, you get 7,146, which again makes absolutely no sense, right? If you travel 50 miles, then you travel 60 miles, um, your distance back, the distance from its original position is not gonna be 7,000 miles. So that's why we know we have to take the square root of that answer and you're gonna get 84.50, which makes sense. So therefore my distance here now is gonna be 84.51 miles. All right, so the next one is gonna be finding the bearing. So the bearing, remember, is gonna be from due north, right? We graphed all of these with the bearing from due north. So I need to be able to figure out this angle from here to here. Well, the only angle I can figure out now is this angle theta, right? And let's just call this, um, since we're gonna use, let's just call this A. Okay, well, to find A, I need to either, I could use, I could use my stored answer here of 84.51, you could use the law of cosines again, or you can see that since we have a obtuse angle here, I'm not worried about looking for the, or I'm not looking for an obtuse angle or anything larger, so I know my angle is going to be acute, so I can just go ahead and use the law of sine. So I'm going to store this as B, just so I can use this again. So I'm gonna store as alpha B, and then now I have a ratio, right? So I can say, um, I need to find the angle. So I can say sine of A over 50 is equal to the sine of stored B over, I'm sorry, yeah, sine of stored 100 over sine B, geez. B is not an angle, it's 100 degrees is an angle. So you could say sine of 100 degrees over stored B. Okay, so now I'll do 50 times the sine of 100 divided by stored B. And then I do the sine inverse of that angle and I get 35.63. So A is gonna equal 35.638 degrees. But again, that's not the bearing. That is angle A, right? So 
it's very important that we understand that from here to here was 40 degrees, right? So from here to here is 40 degrees, and then from there to there is 35.6 degrees. So therefore, we have a bearing of 40 degrees plus 35.638 degrees, which is equal to, you know, 30, I'm sorry, 30, 75.638 degrees. And again, that's just going to be rounded from there, but hopefully you can kind of see how, how finding that angle and how we had just had to make sure we understood that's bearing is going to be from due north. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that was two examples of how to use the law of cosines for side, 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 angle, side, word problems, as well as using Heron's formula. I hope this uh, lesson has helped you out, and I look forward to helping you out on the next one. Cheers.